salvation we know that it's a gift from God but I'm gonna take the verse that most of us have heard or read in John chapter 3 verse 3 in Jesus's conversation with Nicodemus he said Jesus answered and said to him most assuredly I say to you unless one is born again he cannot see the kingdom of God you cannot have a spiritual growth without spiritual birth you cannot join the family of God you must be born into the family of God you can join a club you can join the church but you cannot join God's church you cannot join God's family you have to be born into it a birth is coming into a being of new life which has the nature of your parents what is a new birth well number one it's not religion it's relationship number two new birth is not about morality but it is it is a miracle meaning when you are born again it's a miracle when the baby is born it's a miracle that's why you know you can put a price on your new house you can never put a price on your new baby you can put a price on your new Jordans you can never put a price on your new daughter that's why the Bible says that you can win the whole world but it comes nothing close to your soul because the value of a baby is priceless thirdly is new birth is not reformation it's regeneration meaning it's not changing your behavior it's God changing your nature and changing your heart and giving you a new heart and a new nature new birth is not works but it is by the word of God many of us who have came into Christian faith have adopted a world's view of salvation for example how many of you here have a gym membership I know you're not paying for it right now but just raise your hand yeah okay how many of you have a gym membership okay when you get a gym membership you typically have to agree to certain rules and when you agree to those rules then they make you a member of the gym if you break those rules you lose your membership there are certain privileges of being a member in the gym but you also have responsibilities and you have to monthly pay so you can keep that membership most people view their salvation through the lens of a club in order to join you have to agree to certain rules in order to stay a member you have to pay your dues and God forbid you break the rules you lose the membership then you start again from zero but see kingdom is not a gym it's a family none of you in here had to agree to rules before you were born mama and papa didn't come to an embryo and said do you agree to the 10 rules like taking off your shoes brushing your teeth cleaning the dishes sticking with the curfew do you agree okay we are gonna let you be born in this family birth was a gift you didn't work for it you didn't deserve it and you didn't sign up for the rules you did not know there were rules but because you were born you eventually grew and you found that in your family there are rules every family has rules for example one of the rules in my family is we take off our shoes when we enter the house it's just a family rule it's not right or wrong it's just our family rule we take off our shoes another rule is when we eat we have to put as much on our plate as we are going to finish but if we don't finish my father is the author and the finisher of all the food that we don't finish so my mom would make us all come from our plate and dro drop it on my dad's plate and my dad would finish it because he's the author and the finisher of food these are just simple rules in our house now these are not rules in your house these are rules in our house but I can tell you one thing I was never kicked out of our family because I forgot to take my shoes off these rules were not there to qualify or to conf or to condition my place in the family they were to confirm my place in the family it wasn't so that I can belong to the family it was because I belonged to the family and when I broke the rules repeatedly I never lost my last name I didn't lose my parents and I did not lose my family but I did lose my phone I did lose certain privileges and sometimes I lost my pants and something else went on my behind 
but I never lost my family because when I broke the rules in the family I didn't lose the family I lost privileges my friend I want to remind you when you become a Christian you're not a member of a club you become a part of God's family that's why Jesus calls us children and God our father so rules have a place in God's family but they don't condition our relationship with God. Breaking them doesn't disqualify us from the relationship with God and we have to understand to see God's kingdom as a family not a club. Can somebody say amen? So with that said I would like to highlight Dr. David Jeremiah, a preacher mentioned five birthmarks of salvation maybe some of you have ever wondered how do I know if I am saved or maybe somebody came to you and says how do I know if I am saved today I'm going to help you to understand that I didn't come up with those I copied them from David Jeremiah but they were really good and I just wanted to share them with you the first one is confession have you confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior not have you confessed your sin please understand every criminal in front of a judge confesses his sin even after they caught after they get caught people confess their sins Christians don't confess just their sins they confess Jesus as the Lord and the Savior yes. that's why the Bible says if we confess with our mouth and believe with our heart what that we're sinners no it says that Jesus is Lord so the first mark of a born-again person Christian is confession of Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior the second one is change change that happens within change that happens within their heart and their nature it's when you feel changed on the inside number three it's when you have compassion the bible says he who is born from god loves his brothers see one of the things that happened to you when you got born into the family and you grew a little bit you realize you had brothers and sisters now i'm pretty sure a lot of you had a very difficult time getting along with them and some of you are still seeing a therapist dealing with things that happen with your brothers and sisters nevertheless family gave you brothers and sisters one of the marks of a born again christian is you will have brothers and sisters but it will take time to learn to relate to them as god wants you to relate you will have compassion number four you will have conflict because of new nature you still have an old mind, you still have old patterns, the old man is crucified with Christ but certain habits the old man has developed remained and so there will be a conflict inside of you and this conflict does not mean you're not born again, it actually means you are born again because if you wouldn't have the conflict it means you would be dead and floating with the current. The fact that the devil is fighting you is a sign you're not on his team so it's a good thing it's not a bad thing and the last one is conduct meaning it's when your behavior begins to change now change of the behavior does not mean it doesn't make you born again it's when you're born again that your behavior changes now we as Christians we don't focus on changing we focus on growing the baby as long as the baby grows it will change because you must understand this thing about our nature when you add nurture to it crazy stuff will come out like for example every ba every baby is born within its nature to speak write create marry even procreate and one day have its own children all that nature needs is nurture nurture doesn't make a baby to write, walk and speak. Give the same nurture to your dog. 20 years he still won't write and speak. Give the same care to your cat. Your cat will not wash dishes after 50 years because the nature is not there. When you become born again, God places a nature, new spirit that if with the renewing of the mind, remaining in his presence nurtured that nature is nurtured is taken care of you will become fabulous you will become incredible and you will become amazing you will change because you grew so we don't focus on the change we focus on the growth we know that it's within our nature 
all I need now is to nurture my life, change in my soul so that the change in my spirit will be made manifest in my natural visible realm. So with that said, I would like to talk on for a few moments about this topic of spiritual birthmarks or uh, our salvation. If you are taking notes, write this down. The first point I would like to share is that new nature makes growth natural. New nature makes growth natural. When you and I became born again, God gave us a new spirit. But God did not give us new soul. God did not give us new body. When you became saved, you did not get a new body. I wish we would have gotten a new body. We didn't. You came, if you came overweight, you left overweight unfortunately. If you came not healthy, you left not healthy. If you came white, you left white. If you came black, you left black. Nothing changed on your body and nothing changed on your soul. If you came negative, you left negative. If you came with bitterness, a lot of people left still struggling with bitterness and they may say, well how come then? What was the new birth did in me? New birth gave you new spirit, not new soul. New spirit comes from new birth but new soul comes from renewing your mind, remaining in his presence and resisting the strongholds of the enemy. Alright, so that's why you can look at a person who is born again and not changed, they're still born again. And a lot of people judge Christians because of that and they say people act better in clubs than in church. Probably. In some areas there are heathens who live better than Christians. If you've ever been to a funeral, a funeral is a very well behaved clean place. But if you went to the hospital where babies are born, nothing well behaving there. And a lot of times it's not super clean. When the baby comes out, it's bloody, naked, unruly, loud, a little thing is connected, call umbilical cord and just you take the photo and, and you, you use filters on Instagram because while it's a great miracle, it's not a great photo. And you wait for to wrap the baby up so that we don't have to show all the parts that the baby came out with. And, but it's a miracle. It's life. And then you go to a funeral home and you see this well-behaved, dignified man in a suit. Smelling good. Behaving solid. In orderly fashion. He will not say a negative word. And there is a sense of quietness, a sense of holiness that exists in there. You know, I'll rather take an unruly, loud, bloody baby over a quiet, orderly corpse. So if the world accuses the Christians for being unruly, loud, bloody, crazy, okay, we never claimed to be in a suit. We claim to be alive. We claim to be born again. We as Christians, God is not busy trying to make us into hypocrites, actors on the stage. God is not wanting to put, put masks on us. God wants to give us life. And if we come into this life with blood and umbilical cords, God says, you'll clean yourself up a little bit later. But hey, you got life. You got a spirit that lives inside of you. Yes, you'll get covered. Yes, you'll get clean. Yes, you'll learn how to walk. Yes, we'll cut this and cut that and cut that. But listen, you can do all of that to a corpse. It will not make him come alive. You can spray perfume and cologne. You can put him in the best suit. It's still a corpse. So what that an unchristian can learn how to tame their tongue and control their money and treat people right? It doesn't make them born again. Because new birth is, is a miracle of a new birth and therefore a Christian can sometimes act crazy but if they are growing they'll change. Can somebody say amen? So new nature makes it natural to grow. If growth is difficult for you, you might not be born again. If growing is impossible 
I have the right on God's word to question the validity of your new birth experience. For newborn again Christians, growth is not difficult and impossible, but it is slow. And sometimes slow feels painful. So growth is very slow. The baby does not learn to walk overnight. The growth is slow, but it's not impossible and it's not difficult. Growth is natural. That's why Peter says like newborn babies desire the milk of God's Word. Meaning the nature gives me new appetites and new desires. If you are born again, how you would know it is because there's new desires. There's new passions that are there for God. You will not always satisfy them properly. You will not always do what's right with them. But there is, there is new, new desires there. Can somebody say amen? There is growth and it comes naturally. None of that growth makes you born again but it's because you're born again that you grow your growth doesn't make you born again with the capital b your growth doesn't make you for sure born again when i was born i was told by my parents that i came into this world not knowing how to speak and walk i don't remember that day I don't remember the day of my birth and that's why people who say if you don't remember the day of your salvation you're not truly saved I'm like really I don't remember the day I got saved I do remember that I'm alive in Christ now the same way I don't remember when I was born there's a, a certificate I celebrate July 22nd but you know why I celebrate July 22nd because my parents told me I was I don't remember being there and then I grew I learned how to walk I learned how to talk I finished school I finished high school I got a high school diploma I got a license. I got the job. The interesting part is that none of those growths improved my status in the family to my parents. Meaning I was a son on the day of my birth the same way I am a son when I'm a pastor today. My status as a son did not get upgraded or updated as my condition from a child to a youth to a teenager to an adult to a husband and to a pastor gradually increased one day I will even reach higher but while my condition is constantly growing and growing and growing my position the love my parents have for me the position I occupy in their heart when I couldn't utter a word when I couldn't wipe my own behind when I did not know what it's like to do this and that from that day I was as precious as valuable to them as I am when I am going to be old and gray hair that did not change. All of my growth did not improve my status as a son. The only reason I'm able to grow is because I was a son in their heart and they made a room for me to have unconditional love and conditional acceptance and nurture that caused the nature in me to explode. My friend, all of your growth doesn't make you more saved. The only reason you are able to grow is because you are saved. Can somebody say amen? amen. Number two, new nature does not remove the presence of sin but the practice of sin. When you are born again you don't lose your ability to sin. You lose your ability to enjoy it. You can still sin. It's the same one. You're just not going to be able to enjoy your sin. Because the new nature doesn't sin. Where the sin happens is in the soul. Unrenewed mind. And the new nature doesn't want to sin. And as a Christian, Christians can commit sin. But they don't practice sin. Because the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2 verse 29. Everyone who practices righteousness is born of God. 1 John 3 9 it says the following in NLT those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God now don't let the word practice freak you out how many of you guys practice like certain uh, sport basketball swimming golf practice eating <laughs> I see no all right I see more yeah. all right okay musical instruments practice what is word practice practice simply means it's performing an activity or exercise a skill repeatedly or regularly in order to improve or maintain one's proficiency 
you only practice things you want to get better at true Christian will never do that will never practice sin to get better at sinning true Christian will never use God's grace as an excuse to sin because to them a little bit of grace gets me to heaven a lot of it makes me reign in life so using God's grace they don't use God's grace as an excuse they use God's grace as a reason to overcome sin true born again Christian will fall seven times into the same sin he can't stay there why because he is not practicing something into perfection he wants to practice righteousness so he will get up from that sin and still be righteous so as a born again Christian you still sin you don't lose your ability to sin you just lose your ability to practice sin into perfection what we practice is the perf perfect nature of Jesus that lives within us and we practice that day in and day out not so that we can become perfect it's because we are perfect in our spirit and in our heart through the blood of Jesus can somebody say amen Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 it uses this verse not everyone who says to me Lord Lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my father in heaven I will be very honest with you when I was younger and this verse was preached in the church I was getting saved every time this verse was preached because the preachers usually preachers are really good at taking scriptures out of the context and so they would take this verse and right after that they would give a call to salvation if you call on the name of the Lord but you don't do the will of the Father I'm like this week there was one day I didn't do the will of the Father and then it says over there you will not go into kingdom of heaven I was like man that's me I didn't even wait for all the cause like Lord Jesus please forgive me I didn't believe in this but I did it just in case please forgive me sanctify me can I get saved again amen I got saved again and then they would say even if you do miracles I'm like well that, that's not I don't even qualify that's for everybody who does the miracles that's for them they're not even saved but you have to always read the Bible within the context because later on Jesus says the real reason why those people are not going to heaven it's not because they called on the name of the Lord and didn't do the will of the Father I want you to see this in verse 23 it says then I will declare to them I never knew you the real reason they never had a relationship with Jesus they might exercise certain gifts in a community of other leaders they might have even moved in miracles through the name of Jesus not through their own name they might have called on the name of the Lord they may have professed Jesus but as Christians we don't profess salvation we possess salvation they might have known about Jesus as Christians we know Jesus and he knows us the fact that Jesus tells these people that I never knew you tells me they never had a relationship with the Lord and the evidence of that is the next is the next part of that verse I never knew you depart from me you who practice lawlessness what is the sign that they were never born again they practiced not righteousness lawlessness they practiced to perfection sin lying stealing but the root wasn't the fact that they sinned that's not the problem the problem is they never knew him and because they never had a relationship they couldn't help but practice sin because when you have a relationship when you're born of God you will fall into sin you will struggle with sin you will commit sin you just don't practice sin because you practice something else you practice righteousness because you have a new nature and so you can't use this verse against believers because if you're born again if you know Jesus Christ something will happen here there is a new nature and that new nature causes you to practice righteousness will you always get it right no but you practice that's how you learn to ride a bike that's how you learn to speak that's how you learn to walk you practiced it but you know why it was possible for you to practice and learn it because it was within your nature my dog can practice to speak English all his life he'll never speak English because it's not within his nature but it's within your nature to live right and therefore when you practice that by why do you practice that it was only because you know the Lord it's not so you can know the Lord it's because you know the Lord and you can hide behind the church and profess Lord Jesus is Lord 
say all of that the same way you can walk around I can walk around and say um, I belong to Larry Smith's family that doesn't make me part of that family because I said that the Bible says demons believe and tremble and they're still going to hell believing that God exists doesn't save you belonging to a circle of people that believe in God doesn't save you I've been many times in the airport and missed the airplane you can belong to a religious circle and still miss Christ if you don't see Christ and don't submit to Christ and receive his gift of salvation and submit your life to him and know him not Christians but Christ can somebody say amen and so we see that as Christians we don't practice sin we do struggle with sin. In Hebrews it says this, for you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. So Christians in their spirit, they're sinless. They can't sin in their spirit. That's why the Bible says that if you're born again, you can't sin. And people read that like, that's not me. Your spirit is. Cannot sin. Your spirit cannot sin. Your soul, oh yeah. Because it's unrenewed. It still needs to remain in Christ. There's still certain strongholds, certain wounds that need to be pulled out and it's a process through which we all go in as Christians. Salvation of our soul. That's why there's verses in the Bible that says to do things for salvation of the soul and people read that they're like, so does that mean I'm not saved? No, you are saved. Your soul is being saved. And so dear believers, we struggle with sin. Sometimes the struggle is so severe. The Bible says till bloodshed. Have you seen people struggle with drugs who are born again? Till bloodshed. You've seen people struggle with smoking. Sometimes if the, the struggle is real. Hashtag. And some people even die in that struggle. Have you seen people struggle with depression? Who are born again believers? Yeah. And so to say that just because you struggle with sin, you're not born again, is not against the Bible. Because he's writing to the Christians and says that sometimes in our soul we can struggle still and that's okay that's why we have brothers and sisters that's why we have healing deliverance that's why we have the teaching of God's word so that we can overcome sin we have abundance of grace so we can reign in life grace doesn't give us the excuse to live in sin a born-again Christian will not look to grace to live in sin they will look for a reason to overcome their sin when you washed your car last time and it was raining you hated it because it would stain the car and that puddle by your house that typically when your car is not washed you would never miss you would ride faster you would avoid those puddles why because clean cars cause you want it to be cleaner the more dirty you are the more dirty you want to be new nature causes you not want to sin and if you are living if you are enjoying justifying it's probably a sign you just never experienced new birth experience and you're just reforming your outside and trying to through nurture you can massage a dead man until your fingers lose their connection it'll never bring him back to life you can't massage yourself back to life you gotta repent yourself back to life so you repent accept the grace of God receive the new gift of salvation and God gives you new nature new desires that accompany it can somebody say amen now let's get to bring this message a little bit closer number three Christians don't lose their salvation by struggling with sin. So we mentioned that Christians don't practice their sin but they can still sin and now I'm going to talk about a little bit closer. Christians don't lose their salvation by struggling with sin. As a Christian you don't lose your salvation when you sin but you lose the joy of your salvation. Psalm 51, do you remember when David committed murder and adultery? That's some pretty heavy sins. It's interesting in his repentance David never said Lord restore to me my salvation. He said restore to me the joy of my salvation. As a Christian you don't lose your salvation when you sin. You do lose the joy, closeness. You can die faster when you sin. You can even open the door to a demonic torment. You can end up in jail. You can forfeit your reward as a Christian but you don't lose your relationship as a Christian when you sin. In 1 Corinthians it says that one day we'll stand before God and the eyes of God's fire will go through our works and what was built on wood, hay and straw will be burned and it says this and we will be saved as though from the fire yet we will be saved. Meaning our bad works that we do they don't cause us to lose our relationship. They cause us to lose our reward. 
Can somebody say amen? They don't cause us to lose our salvation. They cause us to lose the joy of our salvation. Now for those of you who your mind is freaking out right now. Oh my gosh Vlad you just gave somebody a license to sin. Can I just calm you down? Those who are not born again, they don't need license. Does every criminal wait for a permit to do something criminal? No. <laughs> okay, so relax. I'm giving grace to people who are going to use that to overcome their sin. And those who want to overcome their sin, they don't need that grace. They're going to still use a reason to sin. <laughs> As Christians, we don't lose our salvation. We lose the joy of our salvation. I would like to go a little bit further. I like what Dr. Michael Brown said. This topic, first of all, I want to say it is controversial. There is four main thoughts, three big ones, we belong kind of to the fourth one, of thoughts concerning losing your salvation. The first big thought is that once saved, always saved. In the sense that you can never lose your salvation. Um, you can deny Jesus. You can even go and become a Muslim or a Buddhist. But once you pray that prayer, you will always save. You can completely reject God, insult the Holy Spirit, trample the blood of Jesus. It doesn't matter because it's called eternal and you're done with. And the second uh, school of thought that exists is called the perseverance of the saints. The perseverance of the saints believes that if you are born again, then you will not lose your salvation. And if you disowned Christ, uh, turn your back on the grace of God, walked away from Jesus. It just simply means you were never really saved. The third school of thought is where most of us grew up in. It's that your salvation is secure until your next mistake. And the moment you commit sin or you fall, you lost your salvation and then you have to start everything again and you have to repent and then you have to get saved again and pretty much you get you lose it and one day sometimes you can do it like five times you lose it and you get it back you lose it get it back you commit sin God takes it away and then you repent God gives you back the salvation and then there's a fourth one where it's a little bit of everything <laughs> and that's where we are at now I don't believe Christian can lose their salvation like you lose your keys you don't lose your place in the family when you forget to take the garbage out Come on. You don't lose your marriage because you had a bad day. You don't get disowned for that. My, 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 my dear brother was, was living on drugs for seven years. <laughs> he didn't lose his family. In fact, he grieved his family. We were all heartbroken. It was bad for all of us and for him. But if it wouldn't be for the family, he would have never changed. And God knows that. And so God doesn't disown his children who fall, even if it, it's into the same sin, struggling. We don't lose our salvation. I like what Dr. Michael Brown said. He said this, you can't lose your salvation like you lose your keys. Passenger on the plane is guaranteed to reach its destination overseas. Unless you choose to do something crazy and open the emergency door and jump. Otherwise you won't arrive at your destination safely. Now I believe that you cannot lose your salvation as a Christian but you can forfeit your salvation as a Christian by rejecting Jesus and his grace. Few reasons and I've studied you know both of them and I have preachers on both sides that I deeply loved, deeply love till this day. The part what I have struggled with once saved always saved that you cannot lose your salvation is I just don't see in the Bible where the scripture tells us that once you're saved you are taking away the right to reject Jesus and you no longer have a free choice. Salvation does not take away your choice to reject Christ. That would look more like a Colombian cartel than salvation. Where you can get in but you can't get out. <laughs> Same thing with the family. You can disown your family. You can completely, I'm not just talking about you move out. I'm talking about you can disown your family, go change your last name. It's not a trap. Your family is not a trap. Now nobody in their right mind I think would never do it. But to say that that's not possible, we just don't see the evidence of that in the Bible. Contrary we see in the Bible verses like that if we sin against him, meaning we reject him, God says I'll blot your name out of the book of life. So that means that when my name is written in the book of life, I have the choice to turn my back on Christ and say you know what, I don't believe in grace. I can be saved by my good works. In fact, I'm going to follow another God. I'm going to follow another person. God doesn't say well I'm sorry bro but you're stuck with me. I think that's not love. That's force. And God gives us a choice. Verses for example in the Bible in John chapter 1 where it says any branch in me that does not bear fruit. It doesn't say that God cuts it away. It says he lifts up. That speaks to Christians who are in Christ, in God's grace. But honestly they don't have fruit right now. 
They don't have love. They don't have patience. They're really cranky. They really have issues. And Jesus doesn't come and say, you're done. You're gone. Why? Because you don't have fruit. The Bible says he lifts us up if we don't have fruit. But then later on in verse 6, if I'm not mistaken, it says that, but any branch that doesn't abide in me gets thrown away. Meaning God says, if you still have a choice to reject my grace and do it your own way, that branch gets thrown into the fire. In Hebrews it says that, and this verse used to scares me, it says this, for if we willfully sin after receiving the knowledge of truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Your readers like, oh shoot, that's me. Because I mean, come on, let's face it, a lot of our sins are willful. It wasn't, we didn't get slapped into it, you didn't get hit, for, it's willful. But you always have to read the verse in context. If you read the verse later, it says the following. It says, how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy? Will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified as a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? So it's not you sinfully, you willfully sinned. Because all of us who sin, of course we do it willfully. You, you were not out of your mind when you were doing it. You didn't lose your mind at the time. You would do it willfully. What it simply means is people, they reject the grace. They reject the blood and insult the Holy Spirit. And God says, my sacrifice doesn't cover you. Now for most of us in here, it's not going to be switching religions. It's not going to be that one day you're going to decide to become Muslim. Or one day you're going to decide to turn your back on Christ and become a Buddhist. For most of us as Christians, this is what the problem happens. Is we switch from Christ to our works. We outgrow our need for Christ. We no longer remain on the branch, on the vine, on Him as the source of our grace. And we feel like, well, I got saved. Jesus, I got it from here. It's like I'm 30,000 feet in the air. I got it from here. Thanks, pilot. And then you're simply stepping out of the plane. I believe I can fly. And so what I'm preaching to you today is remain in Jesus. Remain in Him. Because he is not just someone to get you up in the sky. He says, I want you to remain in me. Stay in the plane. The door, exit door is there. You can't jump out. I can tell you one thing. You can't fly, my friend. There's only one name under which man was given to be saved. And that is not Jose or Juan. It's Jesus. It's Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. So I believe as Christians, our salvation is secure. Our salvation is secure, but we must remain in Christ. And this is not a, uh, it's a privilege to remain in Christ. It's, it's an honor to remain in Christ. I'm not talking about prayer or reading or even church attendance. I'm talking about remaining in Christ. His grace continues to flow, changes and transforms us. And I believe we have a choice to turn our back on Him and totally walk away from him and walk away from the grace of God walk away from our salvation and walk away from our Savior I just don't see a verse where it says once you're saved you're trapped and you can no longer leave it would be very difficult to serve a God who traps you in that I think God gives us a choice and most of us all of us we would never take that choice when you were in the airplane I'm not gonna lie to you I've been in the airplane I had a thought to open that door <laughs> I knew it was the devil. <laughs> I was like, I commend you. Get out in Jesus' name. I'm like, why would I want to do that? You know, but, but the thoughts did come. And so I would never do it, of course. I many times got off from the airport, from the airplane and went to the bathroom. That's different than jumping out of the plane. Switching your seats is different than leaving the plane. And so I just want to challenge each one of you to stay in grace. Stay in Jesus. And I'm going to finish this message where I believe something that is very important. Can Christians go to heaven if they die unconfessing, not confessing certain sin or forgetting to confess certain sins? I believe yes and this is why. The Bible says Christ has forgiven us of all sin. Can somebody say all? The original word for all includes past, present and future. Think about it. All of your sins your future sins 
your past sins, all of them were at the moment of his death were your future sins. When Jesus was dying, you haven't committed any of them yet. On the cross, he paid for all of your sins. All of your sins were future sins. I believe when you're born again, your sins are paid for present, past and future. Christ doesn't come down on the earth next time you sin. He's like, oh shoot, I forgot that one. In fact, you didn't even exist when he was paying for your sin. He paid for all of your sin. When you are forgiven in Christ, you are forgiven those sins are already covered by the blood. The future sins you're yet to commit. You may say, then why do we confess our sin? First of all, you're not saved by your confession. You're saved by Christ. You don't see it in the Bible where it says, if you confess your sin, you will be saved. It says, if you confess Jesus as Lord, you will be saved. Our confession doesn't save us. Jesus saves us. Our faith doesn't save us. Jesus saves us sinner's prayer doesn't save us. Jesus saves us. Even your repentance doesn't save you. Jesus died on the cross, now repentance. So we have to go back to Jesus. We have to go back to the cross. Please understand, I believe in confessing sins, but I don't believe it's so that I don't lose my salvation. It's so that I stay close to Jesus. I've been married to my wife for 10 years. 10 years ago on this altar I said, I do. Since that day, do you know how many times I said, I'm sorry? A lot. I'm going to probably say, I'm sorry today. You know how many times I'm going to say, I'm sorry in the next 20, 30 years? A lot. Do you know why I say, I'm sorry? Not so that I undo, I do. I don't say, I'm sorry and then go back and get married to her again. My, I'm sorry is to keep closeness. It's not to keep the covenant. I do create a covenant on which today I say I'm sorry so I can stay close within the covenant I already have. My I'm sorry does not get me my covenant back. My my sorry keeps me intimacy but my I do gave me relationship. You have a relationship with Jesus. You have a relationship with God. When you got saved, when you placed your trust in Jesus, by grace you were saved through faith. Can somebody say amen? And then you confess your sin, not so that you get your salvation back, so you get your intimacy back, so you get your joy back, so you get your peace back, so you will grow closer to God with whom He is your Father. That's why 1 John 1 9 it says if we confess our sin he's faithful and true to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us. Meaning God says if you come saying I'm sorry God said like, I'm gonna cover you. I'm gonna cleanse you. I'm gonna forgive you. Please understand I do that almost every few days with my wife. The more I'm sorry as long as I mean it and follow up with a little action, a lot of action and uh, my relationship gets closer but it's not so that I don't lose my marriage. It's so I don't lose my fire, so I don't lose my closeness. It has nothing to do with the covenant. It all has to do with the closeness. That's why Christians repent. The Bible says so we can be healed, so we can be restored. Jesus washes the disciples of his feet and he says, I don't wash your feet because you're not clean. He says all of you are clean except one, referring to Judas. He says a clean man only needs to wash his feet. He's speaking spiritually. He says a man who is cleansed by already Jesus only needs to forgive, you know, forgiveness, confession of his sin because he's already clean. Like this, you take a shower one time but you wash your hands many times. The shower is when you got saved but washing of the hands is when you confess your sin so that you don't get germs to stay in you because those germs neglected become infected. So that's why we confess our sin. What if at the moment of your death, there were some sins that were unconfessed? Can I tell you something? Nobody in this room will have every sin confessed properly at the moment of their death. Unless you had six months in the hospital. For most of us, that's not going to be your lot. When you die, it will happen fast. It will happen quickly and you quote unquote, 
did not get prepared for it. I want to just remove that fear. You're not saved because you kept track of every sin and you confessed it properly. You're saved by Jesus. You're part of His family. You have a covenant with God. You shouldn't let the sins harbor in your heart because it will create a distance between you and Jesus. It can rob you of your spiritual reward. Your heart can get cold toward the Lord. You should constantly confess your sins so you can be freed, so you can be cleansed. The same way you should always wash your hands. You feel better. It's for your good. I struggle with this myself, especially when somebody would take their own life. In, in the Bible, suicide is never portrayed as a good thing. All the people mentioned that committed suicide in the Bible, there was very complicated and, and crazy stories around them. A lot of people struggle with mental illness and then they take their life. I think suicide is sin. But it's not a sin God cannot forgive or hasn't forgiven in Christ. Suicide is when a person no longer looks to Jesus to deliver them but to death to end their suffering. A person doesn't do it because they're bad. A lot of times they're hurting. And those of you who never had a family member who struggled with mental illness, we would never know. But I've seen a person who took his own life, who loved God, who was here the day before at morning prayer and who took his life. I've also been at the funeral of a young man who struggled with sin of drugs and who finally beat it. And then two months later, he um, overdosed at his work. He slipped and the little dose that he took, turns out it wasn't little, it was more and he died at his work. So is George Floyd just a week ago. You know when he died in the very tragic murder when you know an officer, crazy officer who's had a history of proclivity to violence, you know put his knee to his neck and while we mourn that death a lot of people speak of Floyd's faith in Christ. But I remind you at the moment of his death he forged a check. He committed a crime and they found drugs in his blood when they did an autopsy. Yet when we think of George Floyd's death, nobody sees him through that. I am not encouraging you to justify, contain sin. But I want to tell you something that your conf unconfessed sin is not what disqualifies you from heaven. Nobody in this room will be able to die at the moment of their death having every single thing confessed. And if you can, that's not what saved you. It's what Jesus who saves you. So I want you to live with peace. Pursue the Lord. Not live in terror and fear. My fear is many Christians have a hat of condemnation instead of a helmet of salvation. Last year I got a ticket driving my, riding my moped and they gave me a ticket and a sad day because it was a park guy guy who works at the park, not even like a real police officer. I know he's a police officer and please forgive me Lord. I don't think he's a real police officer because he did not have those sirens that the real police officers have. And I was riding from the church to, to the house and, and guess where he pulled me over? In my garage. Well he pulled me over a little bit closer but I parked my thing in the garage and I mean I guess I could have acted you know saying sir you can't step in it's my property and have a gun but I don't have a gun. And, and, and I don't do that. And I was scared of the police. I'm scared of, in a healthy fear, I fear police officers in a, in a healthy way. And, and he said, sir, you know you're driving without a helmet. And I'm standing in my garage and I said, well, I, I mean in my garage. He gave me, he gave me a ticket for not wearing a helmet. This is the crazy part. I had four of them in my garage. You know why I got a ticket? Not because I didn't have a helmet. It's because I didn't wear one. Many of you will suffer in your walk with Christ, not because you're not saved, but because you're living out of your condemnation instead of salvation. You will have head injuries all the time. You will have headaches, spiritual headaches because you're not wearing, meaning you're not living conscious. I am secure in Christ. I am secure in God's grace. I don't have to worry about my salvation. Nobody can snatch me out of His hand and I'm not planning to leave Him, disown Him or walk away. I love Jesus. He loves me. He is my Father. He is my Savior. My friend, put on the helmet of salvation. Take off the hat of condemnation. Whatever the religious beliefs that you believe that imprison you, take them off and put on Jesus Christ. Put on Jesus Christ and live for God. Overcome your sin. Overcome every devil. Overcome every demon. Overcome every shame. Overcome every guilt. And live for God. Come on somebody. If 
you believe it, give God some praise right now. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Come on, let's rise to our feet right now. Come on, let us raise our hands right now for just a few seconds. Begin to thank God for the great salvation that He has given you. Begin to thank God for who you are. Begin to thank God for your position in Jesus. For some of you who always struggled with fear, who always struggled with condemnation, I just speak that over you. Those who are in Christ, there is no condemnation because you are in Jesus. He gives you power. He gives you grace. He brings you close and when you confess your sin, He brings you closer. He restores you. He heals you. He cleanses you. Oh, Holy Spirit, glorify Jesus in our mind. Holy Spirit, exalt Jesus in our mind. Come on, every hand raised and every mouth no open for the next 60 what, seconds. Open up your mouth. Just begin to thank God for your salvation. Begin to thank God for the grace of God. Begin to thank God for your birth, for the miracle of your birth. of grace cause you to reign in life the gift of righteousness overcome every shame every guilt every sin that easily ensnares you let it give you strength to run your race looking up to Jesus not to yourself the author and the finisher of our faith connection with the father because of things you did just ask him to cleanse you right now ask his blood to wash you right now 
Maybe in some areas you grieve the Holy Spirit. Maybe in some areas you've fallen into. Get up right now. Come on. Next 60 seconds. Just take that prayer. Say, Lord, cleanse me by your blood. Lord, cleanse me by your blood. Give me new desires. God, restore my hunger. Restore my appetite for your word. Restore my appetite. Lord God, restore to me the joy of my salvation. I desire intimacy with you. I desire cleanness. I know you're speaking for the truth in my inner parts, God. Oh, Lord God, take not your Holy Spirit. Pour out your your mighty spirit and your mighty grace upon my life God I choose your grace I choose your love I choose relationship with you I choose your mercy God I choose the victory on the cross I look to Jesus I don't look to myself for change God I look to Jesus I want to be close to you I want to be near you I want to be intimate with you Lord in Jesus name I want to give an opportunity right now for those people in this room who have yet to give Jesus their proper place. Jesus is inviting you. Jesus is proposing a wedding. He's proposing a marriage. As I've mentioned, having a relationship with my wife, never once in 10 years have I thought that if I did something, she's going to leave me. Or if she did something, that I will leave her. But confession caused us to get closer and closer and closer. And I live with a different fear and that is I just don't want to live my life in mediocrity with her. I want to be close with her. I don't want to just go through the motion. I want to be in the passionate love with her. But I do have a choice. I can cheat on her. This covenant doesn't mean that I'm totally incapable. Now, I don't know why in the right mind I would do that. But the choice is there. And as a Christian, that's what I want to remind you. Don't focus on losing. Focus on staying in the grace and the love of the Father and the love of Jesus being his son and being his child being married to Jesus but maybe you're in this room and Jesus is not your bridegroom Jesus is not the Savior Jesus is not your Lord today is that day to accept Jesus my friend I have to give you a warning if you don't accept him you're gonna have to use your good works to save yourself Judas is a prime example of that I'm one of those people who believe that Judas wasn't saved because Jesus referred to him as a devil, called him son of perdition and during washing of the feet he says all of you are clean except one, talked about Judas and though Judas cast out demons and Judas, Judas hang out around Jesus's crew but Judas had a demon enter inside of his spirit. Peter was sifted by the devil, Peter was possessed by the Judas was possessed by the devil but the part is when Judas committed sin Judas had nowhere to run to so he guess what he ran to he decided to deal with his sin with his good works he took the money and returned it thinking it's gonna give him peace it only gave him harm and then he committed suicide I believe the state of Judas is the state of every person who looks to himself to try to find forgiveness or to his good works you can't be saved by your good works you can't undo the bad with the good there's only one Savior his name is not works it's Jesus. This Peter who forsook Jesus, Jesus restored him. He became an apostle. But Judas, he tried to work for his salvation. Work for removing that shame and guilt. It only killed him. He became an apostate. Jesus is inviting you today. He wants to forgive you. He wants you to find peace with God. He wants you to have a new heart and new nature. That gift and miracle can happen right now. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you are in this room or watching through the medium of YouTube, Facebook or podcast and you're saying, I would like to get born again today. I want God to do a miracle in my heart. I am tired of trying to change and transform myself by my strength. I want to accept the free gift and I want to be born into God's family. If you're that person, when I count to three, just raise your hand high. One, two, three just raise that hand high if you're watching me right now you can just comment below and say i would like to get saved i would like to give my life to jesus i'm going to pray with you right now if you raised your hand or you wanted to raise your hand remember it's not that that gets you saved it is jesus but let's pray together right now i want you to say lord jesus i am a sinner please forgive me of all my sin and wash me with your precious blood i repent of living by myself for you come and live in me live through me 
change me help me to grow fill me with your spirit and I promise to love and follow you all the days of my life in Jesus name Father, I pray for that person who prayed that prayer for the first time right now, that you will give them the gift, the miracle of new birth. Take away the heart of flesh. Take away the heart of stone. Give them the heart of flesh. Take away that old nature and give them the new nature right now, Lord God, that desires good things. Cleanse them, purify them, and make them holy and make them whole in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer and you are here, could you come and say hi to us at the VIP room? We would love to say hi to you. If you are online and you prayed this prayer, pick up your phone right now and I want you to go to hungrygen.com slash VIP and submit your card so we can follow up with you this week.